We are taking up a report tabled in US Congress that claims that the Chinese government planned the Galwan incident where 20 Indian soldiers laid down their lives fighting the Chinese troops. In its just released annual report, the United States China Economic and Security Review Commission says that Beijing scaled up a coercion campaign against India. The report says that while the exact reasons for Chinese motivation to provoke India on the line of actual control is unclear, the proximate cause of the clash appears to be to harm India's strategic and economic interest. The Galwan incident heightened tensions between the two countries with both sides massing troops on their respective borders. So what are the ramifications of this report and what can we make out from China's aggression? Well, to discuss more on this issue, we are joined with panelists of three very important guests. Well, Lieutenant General Dr. Rakesh Sharma, Distinguished Fellow from CLAWS, former Ambassador Prabhu Dayal, and Jaydev Ranade, former Additional Secretary, Cabinet Secretariat. Well, thanks very much for joining us, gentlemen. Let me start with you, uh, Ambassador Prabhu Dayal. What at the outset, at upfront, we can make from this report that is just tabled in US Congress. Of course, for us in India, it's no secret that it was all planned by China. But what does it have, what does it mean when, when a US Congress tables such a report? Well, at the outset, as you put it, let me submit that I, like many other analysts, mm -hmm. have said on many occasions, including discussions on TV channels, that the Galwan incident was not something that happened locally or spontaneously, right, but right. that it was a planned incident mm -hmm. which had the clearance from the top level political and military leadership in Beijing. Now, our view has been firmly endorsed by the recent report of the USCC or the United States China Economic and Security Review Commission, which, as you know, is an important congressional commission of the US government. Right. It was created uh, in 2000 and is responsible for monitoring and investigating security and trade issues between the US and China. Now, the years that I served in the United States made me realize that the USCC is a highly respected commission mm -hmm. and the recommendations which it provides to the US Congress are taken very seriously. Now, as you mentioned, the just released annual report of the USCC has said that there is evidence which suggests that the Chinese government had planned the Galwan Valley incident and that it had taken into account the fact that there would be fatalities. Hmm. In other words, the political and military leadership in Beijing had a murderous and criminal intention. And the USCC report brings this out in very clear and unambiguous terms. Uh, I think uh, the report also is correct when it states that Beijing had ramped up a coercion campaign against its neighbors, provoking military or paramilitary standoffs with countries from Japan to India and much of South Asia. And very significantly, it mentions that some weeks prior to the Galwan clash, the Chinese defense minister, Wen Wifengi, had made a statement encouraging his country to use fighting to promote stability. And an editorial in the uh, Chinese Communist Party's mouthpiece Global Times had warned that India would suffer a devastating blow to its trade and economic ties with right. China if it got involved in the US-China rivalry. So mm. there are many angles, but one thing is very clear, that it was a deliberately provoked incident and to my mind the chinese government has to be held accountable for it well well right uh, uh, ambassador there i'll just stay on let me uh, let me open up debate and have uh, jaydev ranade uh, former additional secretary cabinet secretariat uh, sir many thanks for joining us let me start with a very basic question here sir 
is it for the first time that even world is coming to know that both the the political leadership and the military leadership of china is involved in escalating tension within its with its neighbor with a lot eyeing a larger ramifications both civil as well as economic actually uh, adit uh, i think uh, ambassador dal has spelt out uh, the larger picture of what's happening right but to get to your point let me say that uh, capitals around the world mm -hmm. have been watching very carefully what has been unfolding since early may and uh, i'm not taking into account either washington or moscow who um uh, would probably have had prior notice their electronic uh, and uh, satellite capabilities are well known and they are very advanced and there was a hint of that also in this uh, uscc report um where they did talk about satellite uh, pictures among the evidence that pointed to the presence or the gathering of large numbers of pla troops which is the people's liberation army troops uh, uh, in the valley before the incident happened uh, in galwa but uh, there are three four points i'd like to mention here apart from the fact that the capitals around the world were watching it very carefully the question comes why were they watching it carefully after all everyone is now assessing why china is doing this mm -hmm. also everyone is well aware that there is one man who actually sits at the apex at the top of the military and political leadership of china and that is xi jinping the chinese president right um he has many hats uh, which is why he is called the chairman of everything but as far as the pla is concerned he literally controls everything from the um, operations to the uh, anti corruption campaign including to the joint operations of the pla uh, which means he's really put himself on the front line but coming to this um, what we also see is that it is a planned premeditated and deliberate escalation of tensions with india obviously there is a larger objective and i have said this on uh, your channel and uh, others where uh, my colleagues were also present there is a bigger agenda which they have uh, so it's moving as per a plan mm -hmm. um, and if of course as the uscc report says i think it quotes uh, another person uh, saying that if the objective was to keep india away from the united states they have failed certainly they have but there are two three important things here first this uscc report is a bipartisan this commission is a bipartisan commission so it has republicans as well as uh, democrats there which means it reflects the wider body of opinion of the united states political establishment the second thing is that there are some acknowledged china experts and mm -hmm. researchers in the uscc and the uscc is known to do and from what i have seen its reports over the years they do a very thorough and comprehensive job of uh, doing their research without uh, really taking sides right finally uh, the thrust of this uh, report there is that uh, not only xi jinping but the chinese establishment is on a, uh, a mission shall i say or is trying to fulfill its ambition of becoming uh, the leading power in the world uh, and which of course means rivaling or taking on the united states but for us in this area what mm -hmm. it means is the chinese want to be the sole and preeminent power in the indo pacific so right. for us there right. are many ramifications and uh, if i may just uh, and conclude with a final point right, that this report also lists the various major incidents that have taken place since 2013 starting from the depsang plains then chumar butse etc and uh, pointing to the fact that this is a sustained campaign and it also indicates that this is not the end because it left the uh, 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 you know final aspect open as to what the end game will be so i think um, as far as we are concerned um, it's a good thing that this report has uh, been published it's a good thing that the report has uh, taken into account the aggressive policies being followed by the chinese and it's a good thing that it has pinpointed the fact that uh, uh, the chinese have uh, with deliberate planning uh, targeted india 
I would say almost, uh, I would use the word attacked India and uh, committed large scale aggression all along our line of actual control. Right, right, right. Well, stay on, uh, Mr. Ranade. Uh, let me have Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma in the show as well. Uh, sir, uh, at the outset, if I may ask, uh, can the issues or the challenges that is that India faces from China in terms of uh, the aggression, in terms of uh, the violations of LAC, and of course, like the pre planned strategic attack on India's territory. Can these be addressed by diplomacy alone from the old book style? Or we need something else? Thank you, Rajat, for inviting me. At the That's outside, it. I'd absolutely agree with what uh, Ambassador Prabhupada and also Mr. Ranade has said. This was premeditated. It mm -hmm. was pre-thought about. It is not a question of 1,000 troops which the report refers to. They had two divisions brought in even before they started venturing into the LSC and, and uh, attempting to transgress across. So the thought process went well beyond it, well before it. So the question is not of just 1,000 in along Gal Galwan, but right. it is along a larger 800 kilometers frontage. So that matters tremendously in the thought process of how they planned the whole operation together. And it was not Galwan alone. Well, Galwan became the focus after the casualties came up and, you know, 15th of June incident. But there were many instances that happened in Galwan even before 15th of June after May, which actually did not come, the casualties did not come across, but it mm -hmm. came into focus after the, that date. And similarly, instances have happened in elsewhere else. Uh, elsewhere, like in Gogra and Hot Spring, where also troops came fairly close to right, uh, right. Uh, blows. And, you know, another Galwan could have happened in somewhere else. So the fact of the matter is that this was an exceedingly well-planned issue that was uh, uh, over a period of time. To say uh, that, you know, they were expecting and be ready for casualties, Mm -hmm. which is given the report. I respect the report. It's a tremendous report, voluminous one. Right. Uh, India has mentioned partly, but there are many major issues being covered about global order and international relations per se. But the fact of the matter is that they, what the, the Chinese were trying to do in this uh, in this region was actually, they, they were actually worked up tremendously about growing relationship with uh, United States. Right. And that's the issue that they have mentioned and again and again. Now, the, to reply to the question whether we are prepared or whether it is a diplomatic issue or a military issue. See, foreign and security policies go hand in hand. You can't divorce one from the other. Mm -hmm. And each have got its own place to play. If we see these eight rounds of conversations, 210 uh, hours of discussion that have taken place in Moldo, it's the first of its kind among many firsts that have taken place. Right. And among these 210 hours of discussions, the people present on the opposing side had political commissars from the uh, from the lowest body right to the political commissar who came from Beijing from the CMC itself. So it had the backing and the sanction of the CMC, which is chaired by Xi Jinping. And in fact, uh, there is some kind of news saying that one of the gentlemen who came and sat down in the discussion came from the president's office himself. So this is all a very well orchestrated issue here and which was well planned in that manner. Mm -hmm. To put it this way, we have to, when we, issues have to be discussed, they have to be discussed as multi-fora. See, what is happening in Moldova and Chishul is one. What is happening in WMCC is another. Maybe it, in times to come, there will be political uh, push also to uh, bring about some kind of rapprochement to the issues. But the, the, uh, the point I wish to raise is that the Chinese have come in for a long haul, not only in these areas, but by the attitude and the behavioral pattern that they have showed in the course of last uh, couple of months. And we have to be thinking as to what is the behavioral pattern transcend itself to the next event that may happen subsequently. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, we're well put, uh, uh, Lieutenant General. Uh, now, uh, uh, Ambassador Dayal, so do you also agree that Chinese have come here for a long haul and of course it will be 
it will take more than just diplomacy to actually come to any resolution or, or perhaps this will linger on for some time? Well, uh, there is no doubt that the Chinese have come in uh, for a long haul. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, uh, the Wuhan spirit has evaporated. And I mm -hmm. think it is replaced by what I call the Ladakh landslide in our relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the true colors of our emerging relationship with China cannot be kept out of our sights. I think that what lies ahead is not going to be a relationship where the two Asian giants will work together, as was thought at one time could be possible. Uh, but what is likely to happen would be this sort of a continuing tension at the line of actual control, which will, uh, which will no doubt inflict additional costs when our nation is battling COVID right. and related economic woes. But frankly, this is what the Chinese leadership wants. Mm -hmm. You know, the, Ch the Chinese have been uh, uh, hurt, if I may put it that way, by our very tough action because we banned Chinese apps mm -hmm. and we kept Chinese companies out of uh, public sector contracts. And the Chinese uh, are acting like a wounded dragon and trying to inflict costs on us. Uh, mm -hmm. Very frankly, the game-changing maneuver, which was ex executed by the Indian Army on the night of August 29-30, was that we positioned ourselves atop certain heights and thereby yes. acquired yeah. a strategic advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Frankly, the Chinese have not been able to stomach this. Mm. They do not think that uh, there is uh, any option for them but to uh, either talk us to vacate that or force us to vacate that. But we are equally determined that whatever strategic advantage we have attained will not be frittered away. So, to my mind, this uh, tension between uh, our two countries will continue. And we should mm. also remember that China has not honored any agreement with India. So, why will it be honoring any agreement which uh, it might pretend to be working out with us? Uh, China, frankly, insists on its 1959 claim line. Hmm. And we have never accepted this. Right. And uh, it Absolutely. just happened that we were preoccupied battling COVID-19. And China, therefore, attempted to push the line of actual control westwards. The Indian Army resisted this. So that is where I think the situation will continue to be. Because the Chinese want us to accept uh, certain new claims. You know, for instance, now they are claiming the whole Galwan Valley belongs to them. And there is no way that India will accept that. So I don't think that uh, the this, this situation on the ground is going to be changed and we are, we are in it for a long haul. Well, uh, Mr. Ranade, in, in your previous reply, you just mentioned that China mm -hmm. has a well-devised plan and they are indoctrinately focused on that and they're moving ahead with that plan. Uh, what challenge does that plan poses first to us and perhaps later at the regional and global scale? Um, I think that question is uh, very pertinent. And uh, uh, let me just say that uh, as far as India-China relations are concerned, if I may be frank, there has been a lot of myth building over the years okay. that the world is large enough for both of us to uh, uh, prosper and grow. There is enough space for both of us to share it, uh, etc. Uh, that there has been a lot of friendship and contacts over the years. Uh, if you start quantifying these, you'll find there has not been much. In fact, most Absolutely. of our contacts had been westwards and not from here. Right. But uh, having said this, the Chinese objectives have been very clear. 
that they want to be the only tiger on top of this mountain, which is this region, Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so we don't have a space there. Second, if we go back a bit, we'll find that since 2015, which is when Xi Jinping traveled to Islamabad and announced the China-Pakistan economic corridor, our relationship has been sliding downwards. Uh, despite efforts by Prime Minister Modi to reach out to them, despite his persistence, I may say, to try and uh, maintain the relationships on an even keel and try and introduce some warmth in it. But mm -hmm. there has been a steady decline. And the Chinese made it a condition, saying that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you must start talking to Pakistan, you must ease your tensions with Pakistan, you must resolve Kashmir, and only then look to improve relations with China. So the conditions began being brought in. And even now, at the LAC, what they did, uh, I, I think uh, Ambassador Dayal pointed it out, that they have disregarded all the agreements signed so yeah. far. In other words, we did everything as scraps of paper which could be used when convenient and disposed of. Which brings me to two points. Firstly, um, whatever transpires from these talks that happen at the border, at Moldo, uh, can we trust them? Uh, even if they claim that they're going to pull back uh, their communications, uh, we have to acknowledge, are much better than ours so far. We might build them up, but it takes time. Uh, so they'll be able to move in rapidly. Uh, they're masters of deception. So I think the first question is, can we trust them? Second is, if you accept what I started off by saying even earlier, that they have a bigger plan, and I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll give you an example just now how that's coming to fruition. Uh, then, uh, obviously, uh, if they have that bigger plan, then uh, this is just one step. What they're doing is just one step. There is something else uh, also that they're going to try and attempt to do. And um, in addition to what is uh, bothering them is also the fact that there has been a serious attempt, successful attempt, mm -hmm. at raising our international stature, which has bothered them. They don't like it. They look at our attempts to get into the UN Security Council, to the NSG, etc., as our reaching beyond our capacity, beyond our capability. But actually what they understand is it will mean that we will be positioning ourselves as a rival to them. Mm -hmm. So I think in future, uh, our relationship will be marked by that. But when I was talking about the bigger plan, I was talking about uh, diplomacy having its limits, including military diplomacy in the form of the talks. What I hint at or what I point to is that we have to be prepared for some kind of a military action. Uh, okay. We have to not only be prepared for it, mm -hmm. I think we have to start uh, gearing ourselves up in order to administer some kind of a punitive signal or message to the Chinese if we want peace on the borders for a certain length of time. Finally, uh, what I did mention about the big picture mm -hmm. and what I did say, uh, you know, we are going to see more things unfolding. Uh, just uh, two days ago, on the 30th of November, in fact, the uh, Global Times uh, announced uh, that uh, China is going ahead with building a huge hydropower project on uh, near in Medoc County. Now, if you, for people who've been following this for some years, like I have, uh, this is not an innocent move. This okay. is a huge project which they have. It's part of the diversion of the Brahmaputra project. Right. So it's not Absolutely. just a hydropower. They have right, done extensive sir. studies to say that, you know, this will take care of the entire Southwest China. They are right. at the moment quite concerned about shortages of food supplies in 2035. So, or by 2035. So they are planning to divert the uh, Brahmaputra. And the modernity for that is to have a massive nuclear explosion, small nuclear explosion rather, to right, create right, a massive right. crater for a big dam and for putting up the hydropower project. And this is to take place at the Great Bend, which is where the Brahmaputra turns into India. Right, right. And it will be larger right, than sir. the Three Gorges. Right, so, right. So, uh, you know, you can imagine the impact on in India, where four to 500 billion people live in the indo gangetic belt. Um, suddenly you'll have the Brahmaputra uh, waters being uh, uh, dwindling down. And uh, with all this activity in Tibet, Temperatures are already rising, according to Chinese experts. With the rise in temperature, the glaciers have begun receding. So we will either have flash floods 
or most of our rivers in the north, uh, major river, which are fed by the glaciers, will also, uh, right, the flows sir. will reduce. Right, so sir. we will be in a problem. I think uh, it is time for us now, with all that the Chinese are doing, to start uh, mounting pressure on the Chinese, saying that this is not acceptable, and neither is a nuclear explosion, which will lead to long-term consequences. Right, sir. Right, right. Mr. Anand, uh, well, uh, 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 General Rakesh Sharma, just a closing remark from you. Very, very briefly, I'm just short of time here. Uh, has the world finally acknowledged the bigger picture of China as what Mr. Ranadi just mentioned? With, with, with this report in US Congress. Yes. Yes, the world has acknowledged it. And the reports say so also. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, despite the world having acknowledged it, we have to prepare ourselves for the, uh, for the uh, future. If he says that he's constructing a railway line, from Chengdu to Lhasa, parallel to the um, uh, national